So I need to start off with an apology. I read the wrong second reading. As I was standing there, I went to go over there to bow for the and say my prayer to preach the gospel. I wind, the uh, fans turned my page, and so I did the wrong second reading, so you'll have to look it up. It's a short one, so you can look it up. Today's gospel is a really interesting gospel because we have our Lord Jesus Christ sitting down with the apostles and asking them a pretty important question. You know, did you ever have that, you know, maybe a, I remember as a teenager having this conversation with friends, turn around and go, hey, what's everybody think about me? You know, you're a little nervous asking it. Because some may say, oh, they think you're a great guy. Yeah, some people think you're cool. And then you might get, yeah, they think you're a jerk. You know, <laughs> it's a rather, uh, you know, it's a tough question to actually sit back and be open to actually hear what people actually say about you, right? So uh, hopefully they don't say that uh, the, the last thing, but, uh, but they might, you know, but you got to hear it, right? And so this is interesting because the Lord Jesus is doing this with the apostles. Who do the people say the Son of Man is? He's kind of taking the populist vote. He's taking the poll and seeing what the polls are saying. And guess what? The polls are wrong. Right? They say, some say you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Eh, wrong. Thank you for playing. He's not John the Baptist. Hello, John the Baptist just died. Hello, he was alive at the same time. You know, he's not Jeremiah back from the dead or Elijah back from the dead. They were wrong. The crowds were wrong. As oftentimes they are, right? <laughs> so always be careful taking the populist poll, right? Because the polls can be wrong. Um, and it's interesting because our Lord makes sure that when he gives us the moral law, when he gives us the true teachings of the church, we don't take a poll to find out what people think is what's right and what's wrong, what's true, what's not true. Our faith is not determined by the populace and what everyone says it should be. Well, 50% of the people feel this, or 98% believe this about the faith, or 20% feel this about... That's not the way it works with faith. The beauty of the gift of our Catholic faith, it is not something that we come up with. It's not something that we just kind of take the pole and we go with the feel of the crowd, we go with the wind, we go with the feel of the day. Our faith is something that's divinely revealed to us. It's given to us by Christ. The true teachings of our faith and our morality is something that's gifted to us by God. Not something we just kind of take the poll and ask the crowd what they think. In some evangelical churches, that's what they do. I used to belong to, I founded this group called uh, Shepherds United, and we would all get together, we'd work for the cause of uh, defense of unborn life, the defense of marriage and religious liberty. And I remember at one of our meetings, one of the pastors says, ah, we had a hard night last night. I said, what? Well, we were trying to work out our, um, our creed, like, what? He's evangelical. Try to work out your creed. Isn't it pretty simple? The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, <laughs> right? I'm glad as Catholics, we don't have to sit down and get around and try to figure out what we believe, you know? But they had to try to figure it out because they were missing what our Lord Jesus Christ gives us today. So what happens next? After they get the populist vote and it's wrong, Jesus says to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Now he's talking to the 12 apostles, right? These are the men who saw him walk on water, saw him multiply bread and fish, saw him raise the dead, saw him cleanse lepers, drive out demons, did all these wonderful things. And in his name, they did similar things. And Peter pipes up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter makes his bold proclamation of faith. He probably reflects upon the many things that Jesus was doing, the many things that Jesus said, and all of a sudden just he just blurts it out. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's Jesus' response is interesting. Because Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. 
In other words, Peter's profession of faith was not something Peter came up with. It was something that God the Father gifted to Peter. It was the gift of faith that Peter received. The gift to know that Christ is truly the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. That gift was given to St. Peter at that moment. It was something that Jesus says, Peter, you got that from the Father. (laughs) Who did you come up with that on your own? And then our Lord entrusts to Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth shall be bound. What you make loose may should be made loose. He takes his authority over the church and gives it to Peter so that when he ascends to heaven, when he returns to the Father and sends forth to Peter to, to heaven, Peter is to take charge of the church. Peter is to lead. And then his successors after him in what we call the popes. The Pope comes from the word bridge. Pontiff means bridge. It's our bridge to Christ. He's the vicar of Christ. He is second to Christ. He assists us so that we know the truth. And we know how to live out what God has given to us. Now, I really want to focus on, I'm spending a long time on the the preamble here. (laughs) Really what I want to focus on was this one phrase here by our Lord. Listen to what Jesus says to Peter. And so I say to you, you are Peter, so he gives him his new name, Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Right? So we belong to the church because we belong to the Catholic church founded by Christ upon Peter. But listen to this. And the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. The gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. Other translations would say the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And too often times, I think, when we hear this line, we think of the church being under attack from the outside. And that is true, that the church has been under attack since day one, right? We know that. We know even right now the church is under attack. In China right now, churches are being bulldozed right now. Here in the United States, we saw the burning of statues. In Canada, a burning of churches. In France, the burning of churches happening there. The church has been under attack from day one until this very day. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The attacks of the netherworld, the attacks of Satan against the church will never prevail. The church will always remain firm, will always remain firmly rooted, will always be that rock. But it's interesting, our Lord's words here. It's not that hell will never prevail against the church. Our Lord is saying here, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. In other words, we're not supposed to be, as Christians, on the defense. We're not supposed to huddle around ourselves, protect our faith, huddle around our faith, and kind of just insulate ourselves and bear the attacks of the evil one. Our Lord is actually speaking here about the church being on the attack. It's the church that's on the attack. It's the church militant that is being sent forth against the gates of hell. We as Christians are called to the militia of God, to God's militant church. Remember back, maybe some of you remember when you were very, very younger, those of you who were maybe confirmed before Second Vatican Council, And after the bishop confirmed you, he smacked you. He gave you a tap on the face. Because he was initiating you into the church militant. You're confirmed now. You receive the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. Stand up and get ready for the fight. Called to be that soldier for Christ. That we are on the attack against the gates of hell. Now, when we speak about being on the attack against the gates of hell, we're not talking about with weapons, with guns and swords and so forth. That's not what we're speaking about. St. Paul made it very clear that our battle is not with flesh and blood, that our battle is with principalities and powers, with the things of the evil world. So what is the mission of the battle? To win every soul for Christ Jesus. Every soul. First through prayer, 
That we pray often for the conversion of sinners, especially those people who are so steeped in sin, to pray that they might receive the mercy of God, the liberating gospel of Christ Jesus, that they may find the light who is Christ and may find joy in Him. So we pray for them first. That's the first weapon we have in prayer. The second weapon is that of penance. To actually do penance, to offer sufferings, to offer our little pains, to offer our arthritis, to offer the sufferings of life in union with the cross of Christ Jesus, to obtain the grace of conversion for sinners. That is the second weapon that we have in our arsenal. To spring souls to Christ. We also are called to share the gospel. To share it in such a way it can be received. To try to somehow find out why this friend of ours is not going to church anymore. To listen carefully to why. And to try to bring them the answers that they're searching for. To bring them back to Christ. Back to the sacraments. Back to the fullness of the faith. You know, I often say that if you... Try to give a child medicine that doesn't taste good, and you try to force it down their throat, they're going to vomit it up. If you water it down, it won't do them any good. What do you do, moms? You mix it with applesauce, right? <laughs> you make it taste good. You mix it. You don't dilute it, nor do you force it. You mix it. And so sharing the gospel of Christ Jesus, coming against the very gates of hell, when we present the gospel, we present the gospel in such a way that culture can receive it, the person we're talking to can accept it. We don't shove it down their throats because they'll vomit it back up. We don't water it down or else it's going to be ineffective to them. We present the gospel in such a way it can be received. And then the healing remedy of the word of God can bring them peace. And the healing that there's so much in need of. It is a war. It's a spiritual war. It may get played out in many different ways, as we see in our culture right now. Turn on the TV for more than 10 minutes. You want to avoid the news, right? The cultural war that's happening ultimately comes down to the battle against good and evil, the battle for souls. The battle for each and every human person might come to truly know the love of Christ Jesus, the saving message of the gospel, and receive those graces that God so desires to bestow upon them. I'm not too sure what I said tonight in my ramblings. <laughs> I hope my ramblings made sense along the way in my journeys through the gospel. But today, I just invite each of us to make that beautiful profession in Christ Jesus. When our Lord Jesus says to us, to each of us, who do you say that I am, that each of us are able to make the profession of, Christ, of, of Peter. You are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. And that we, firmly rooted on the rock of the church, will be protected by the rock of the church against the attacks of the evil one. But I also pray that we become active in the church militant, active in sharing the gospel with every soul we possibly can and with the gentleness of Christ to bring them to him that they might have the peace that only he can give. May God bless you and Mary keep you.